Okay, so what we're talking about tonight is the doctrine of immediate inspiration. Um, so let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into it with the time we have. Father, we thank you for the time you've given to us. I thank you for those who are here with us. We ask that you would bless our time as we consider these things, as we meditate upon them. Help them, Father, to illuminate us uh, in understanding our our Bibles and your word, and, and help us, Father, as we share it with others. Uh, that there would be a, a love and a respect for your word, and may it grow among your people. Uh, guide us and direct us in your path. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so starting with immediate inspiration, what I wanted to do, or what I think is important for us to understand, is uh, inspiration is a event that happens in time. This is exceedingly important for us to understand inspiration from our perspective and i know there's a lot that we could argue about as far as whether or not people uh, continue to receive a special revelation from god all right um, there are those who hold to that position uh, we do not we are what you would call cessationists um, and so we don't hold to that um, and so we believe that special revelation ended at the close of the canon or at the giving of the entire canon which is 66 books the 39 in the old and the 27 in the new. And so inspiration happened in a moment. It happened in time. And it happened to those who the Holy Spirit bore along, who carried them, uh, similar to the way a, the sea carries a ship. And so um, that is to say then, well, how is it that, because the big question that needs to be asked is, how is it that the words we have now are considered inspired? Um, and particularly, translations. Uh, we're going to make the case as just kind of an introduction that the inspiration, that inspiration only happened, the, the actual like event in time when God inspired these writers who were born along by the Holy Spirit, that only happened in the first century. And in the first century, uh, it happened in Greek. And then when we speak about the Old Testament, um, writers as well, right? So before the first century. Um, so they were inspired. David was inspired when he was writing the Psalms, and Moses was inspired when he was writing the Pentateuch. Um, but once we get past the first century, there's no more inspiration. So how is it then that we could say that a translation, not just an English translation, a Russian translation, a Spanish translation, how is it that we could speak of them in, in meaningful terms with regard to inspiration. How is it that a translation can be inspired? And so what we do is, is we kind of divide to help to help kind of tease that out, to help kind of put me on that, on those bones, and say immediate inspiration is something the Holy Spirit did in time. And then we use this language that sometimes gets us in trouble. And it's the idea of derivative inspiration, or that is to say that a version, English version, Spanish version, Russian, whatever, anything that's not the original Greek and Hebrew, derives its inspiration quality from the originals. And so we use the word derivative, all right? Now, that's going to be later down the road. Right now, we're talking just about immediate and how inspiration happened immediately, how it happened when the Holy Spirit gave words, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, to the writers of the 66 book canon. All right, so that's our focus. Our focus is not going to be on versions. It's not going to be on the copies. That's going to come later. We're going to talk about the moment, the exact writing of the autograph, the original, the one that is lost and we do not have. All right, but that moment in history, and I, I just, I don't mean to make too much of a beef of this, but I think it's important again to, to bear it out. From a distinctively Christian worldview, inspiration is a historical fact. Like, just as much as George Washington was the first president of the United States, all right? And just as much as these are the United States of America, all right? The same goes for, at one point in human history, the reality that God himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit, inspired writers to write specific words that are themselves inspired and then preserve them for us, those are all historical events. Just as much history as 
our existence or the existence of our great great grandparents or the, maybe you came across you know um the atlantic ocean in the 1700s and that's a historical event all right we want to we want to we don't want to separate um these acts of god in time from what we i guess you would say is just everyday history we don't want to separate those um into like well there's religious history or there's supernatural history or there's history according to belief and then there's like factual history or there's history that is in the history books that we can all agree on right this is not what we do from a distinct distinctively christian worldview so this is a historical thing that happens in time and could be measured you could be there and watch john writing the gospel of john by inspiration god was speaking to him god was carrying him the personal holy spirit carrying him along so all right so an introduction the significance of this lecture is to present a pre-critical understanding or that is pre-enlightenment uh understanding of the doctrine of inspiration to peel away the layers of post-critical glosses uncovering the simplicity of the doctrine ad fonts or right, from the fountain to the end that the standard sacred text the authorized version might be returned to its proper place on the pulpits and in the schools of america the issues of scripture's dictation and infallibility are also addressed in this chapter. And so we are going to have to talk about dictation. Um, I just heard a sermon oh, like last week. Really did not like the idea of dictation. And uh, we're going to see if we can kind of parse that out in a way that is acceptable, that's amiable. You know, this idea of he has to have his free will, but it also has to be God's words. So like, how do these two work together? So the word of God in writing. All right, the initial step of three is to answer the question, what is the relationship between the immediate inspiration, I'm sorry, inspired written word of God and the autographs, the autographs and the standard sacred text? This is part of what I've already discussed. The first step is to describe immediate inspiration, which is what we're going to do in part tonight. Step two is to show how the inspired product of the process of immediate inspiration was recognized and collated in the apographa or the copies of the autographa, the autograph. The third and final step will be to demonstrate that the self-credible perfection or the autopiston, autopistos just means self-credible, it's trustworthy in itself. It doesn't need something outside of it or beyond it to establish its trustworthiness because it's God's word. Um, when, when you speak of something of that magnitude, that God, the greatest being, um, greater than can be imagined being, when that God speaks, there's nothing else you can appeal to to grant God's words trustworthiness, right? They have to be trustworthy in themselves. Um, of the apographa is carried over into the version, imparting to the version self-attesting authority, and here's our language, derived from its conform conformity and fidelity to the Greek original language copies. In this particular case, we're talking about the New Testament, all right? So, um, Angelo, I think is how you say his name, because writing was the first way to communicate the gospel or his will to us, that appears thus. All nations and ages of the world could not be present at the birth of Christ. We know that, right? All the people before Christ who are looking toward his coming, and all the people who have come after and are looking back at his coming. We were not all born, created, cognizant, and able at the moment of Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection to to believe these things to know these things nor be eyewitnesses of his miracles see him rise out of the grave and ascend into heaven put their finger in his sides etc what then will they not believe unless they do like do we actually have to be present in those moments to see jesus turn water into wine to see jesus heal the blind man do we have to see with our own eyes before we can believe or is there another avenue is there another way that's going to be of equal importance. It's going to carry just as much gravity. Do we have a, an instrument that carries just as much gravity as seeing Jesus heal the blind man? So it's we're right there, eye ear witnesses of Jesus's work. Is there something that could be just as authoritative, just as powerful, just as able to influence us, and particularly on the level of faith? Right. Let's go on. Shall Christ be crucified afresh in every age, that we may see him rise from the dead? But because Christ was not to remain always below, not come again in that manner, and it concerned the world to know the gospel, God committed it to writing, and hath made the holy scriptures the safe repositories of the truth, 
that is excellent uh, preservatives against weakness of memory and the rust of malicious design, right? Uh, and so he gives two reasons, right? The idea of malice against the Bible, people trying to destroy the Bible, and weakness of memory, because people forget. They stop telling the stories. Uh, the one thing I think, though, that is important about this quote is he is telling us that the gospel we have has to be of the same magnitude, of the same quality, of the same authority as if you saw Jesus do it himself. So, because because that's how he's juxtaposing it, right? It's either we see Jesus rise again in every age. That's on the one hand. On the other hand is his written word. He says we don't have to see Jesus rise again in every age because he's given us his word in a written form, right? These are the two that he wants to juxtapose, all right? I would compel I would compel my Christian brothers and sisters to consider the Bible to be this way. Um, and I don't mean to jump the gun too much here. Uh, but the argument that we make, uh, that Peter makes, is that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And the question that we have to ask is, is more sure than what? And we we saw this, I, I think we did, in exegetical grounding. In exegetical grounding, the argument that we made is more sure, we have to ask more sure than what? And the more sure we get is more sure than an eye and ear witness of the transfiguration of Jesus, because that's what's on the heels of that verse. He talks about how we saw the Lord glorified, how we heard the Father speak, and then he says, but we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, right? And he talks about, and then this is when he goes on about any prophecy of Scripture. The point is, is that it's, the Bible is of greater value, greater quality. So I don't think um, Angelo here is kind of crossed the line in any way by trying to compare seeing Jesus die and rise again and compare that or juxtapose that to, well, we have the written word, right? Putting those two together. And so I, the, kind of the, the kind of rubber meets the road, the practical value here is, well, do you as a Christian believe, if you had a choice, to either see Jesus crucified, all right, or to have his written word and by his Holy Spirit um, speak to you through his word? And the argument that's being made here, and I think the argument that Peter makes, is that we would rather have his word. We'd rather have his word. And I'll, I'll just tell you a little story here. This is just uh, personal experience. Uh, regularly, well, it hasn't been probably a year or so, I would go out to university campuses and I would ask uh, substantive questions of, of university students uh, from a Christian perspective and just try to carry on a conversation with them. And often what would happen, especially when Christianity became a, a centerpiece of the conversation, I just can't believe that. I, I can't believe in the God you're talking about. I can't believe in the Jesus that you're talking about. And one of the tactics I often use is, okay, well, okay, I understand. Uh, maybe miracles are too hard to swallow for you. So what would Jesus have to do? What would he have to do before you would believe? What would he have to do? And invariably, it would be some, usually the top one is, well, if he would just speak to me, like if I heard a voice, if I heard the voice of God from heaven, like if I heard it, then I would know. Then I would believe. And then I usually point out something like, you know, in Charles Dickens' uh, Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol, when he when he hears Marley, right, and he actually sees Marley, like he's in the room with him, and he's got the chains, and the, it's so frightening, right? This whole idea is when Scrooge is terrified, but what does Scrooge blame it on? He is seeing a ghost. He's hearing the voice of a ghost. The chains and the burdens that he bears because of his sins through his life, right? And uh, I usually put it to the student, you know, like, what is it? Is he like, whoa, I see a ghost. No, that's not his first response. His first response is that I'm probably having some kind of indigestion right now. Uh, I'm having an undigested, there's an undigested biscuit in my stomach. And as a result, I'm seeing this apparition, right? Because even if you were to experience something miraculous, something supernatural, it's easy to explain it away um, that your senses aren't working or that you must have got something wrong, or he's a charlatan, he's some kind of magician, he's a David Copperfield of the first century or something, right? So even though you see it, it does not make it certain. And I think that um, if we were, we we're fair, the Lord has given us his word, and it is a more sure word. Continuing on, um, oh, can you get that for me, Titus? Yes. Can you get that for me? So, um, Let's see, is that just the... Yeah, what? 
The memento of Christ in the divine scripture, in which the mysteries of divinity of his humanity are fortified with certain letter like a rock. So he's just basically describing the scripture here. And he's saying that the mysteries of the divinity of his humanity are fortified with a certain letter. And he says, so fortified, it's like a rock. So he's even using kind of what we would say is Christological language, that it is certain letters. So he's again, talking about the scripture, but it's going to be like a rock. It's going to have the stability, right? This is when um, uh, David says that his feet have been set on a rock, right? This is the same thing. These are the kinds of things that should give us uh, certainty and and uh, a kind of courage and fortitude in our word. Um, now, here we go. I, we've addressed this on our blog a couple of times, um, but this is important. Um, if you don't, I, we've said this a lot, if you don't have Richard Muller's dictionary of, I think it's Latin Greek theological terms, uh, this is a great book. Uh, it is a helpful book in helping us wrestle with, under, understand uh, the language of uh, pre-critical theology, of Reformation era theology. And then before that, um, but um, it, it really gives, sheds a lot of light on when we read specific theological terms in these greater theological treatises that really helps us understand what it is that they're trying to say. And the one of them here is the verba Dei or the voice of God or the word of God. I'm sorry, the, the vox Dei is the voice of God. According to Muller, the Protestant Orthodox distinguish four interrelated meanings of the word of God. Right, so there are four ways of talking about the word of God, and they're all kind of bound up together. All right, so the eternal word of God. This is the second person of the Trinity. All right, this is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is this is He who is equal with the Father, um, the very God of very man. Well, not the very man part, because it's just talking about the second person of the Trinity. It's the very God. It's the the divinity of the second person. But then you have the incarnate word, which is the second person of the Trinity takes on human flesh and becomes the divine human mediator of salvation. So you have the word of God. That's like John one. Right. And then Jesus, who is this revealed word. Right. He is this incarnate word. And then you have the inspired word of the Holy Scripture, which is the wisdom of God given in a form accessible to man but nonetheless grounded in the eternal word and the wisdom of God, God's son. So uh, another, the other language we would use here is Christ is the archetypical word. He is the word of God from which all other forms of the word of God come, uh, uh, proceed forth. All right. So Christ is archetypical. He is the source and the norm of all other things that we would call the word of God, which is scripture. And then lastly, um, the internal word of the spirit, or the testimonium internum spiritus sancti, uh, the verbum internum, which testifies to the human heart concerning the truth of the written or external word. So what we have is Christ, second person of the Trinity. Then we have the incarnate word, Jesus taking on flesh. Then we have the word of the Holy Spirit given to us, as we saw in prior lectures, we were seeing a uh, uh, how Christ was the first apostle, right, sent from the Father, and then he had the apostles, and then we had the apostolic message, and now the Bible, the scripture, is the apostolic message, or it is that upon which the church is built, right, the foundation being the apostles and prophets. And then finally, you have the internal word of the Spirit. So the point is, is the scripture and the word always go together. They're called the word. Christ is the word, and then the second person of the Trinity uh, again, speaking uh, in terms of the word. Uh, this testimonium internum, this was throughout my dissertation. Uh, the idea here is this is, is veridical, right? This is, it is truth creating. It It is true and it can produce truth in us, true belief. And we would say ultimately true knowledge. Uh, but it's important that we understand God's word in this way. We don't want to confuse the Bible with Christ because we don't worship the Bible. And we also don't want to confuse the Bible with, like, the preaching of the word, right? And we don't want to separate the word of God, right, the inspired word, from the internal word of God of the spirit, right? We don't want to separate those two. Like, the the, the inspired word can be put forth in no Holy Spirit at all, and the Holy Spirit speaks apart from the inspired word. No, both of those go together, all right? Yes, question. So would it be appropriate to speak about them being inextricably linked together? 
Yeah, I think that, and and not just not just to make a theological statement. I I think that we're compelled to believe that um, when the Bible speaks of itself in terms of being alive, uh, when it speaks of itself as Scripture is inspired or God breathed, right, and it is breath that gives life. Um, when the Bible speaks of itself as being quick, right, alive and power, powerful than any two-edged sword, the idea is, is that the word and the life-giving spirit always go together, and they don't contradict each other. So we would say that they are inextricably linked, which is another reason why we make the case that when the word of God is read, again, we'll just say read, not even, uh, or let's say heard, when the word of God is heard, not even necessarily read, if you just hear it, the indwelling Holy Spirit bears witness with his own words, his own words. And so uh, this idea then that um, knowing what is or is not God's word is anchored in this truth, this inextricable link between the spirit and the word. So if men's words are preached, the Holy Spirit does not resonate with those words, or I'm sorry, read or heard, the Holy Spirit doesn't say, yes, those are my words. You are hearing the words of God, because they're not his words. But when they are his words, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that that is the inspired word, and that that witness is born out of the internal word by the Spirit. So, yeah, it... I, And this, of course, can get you in a lot of hot water with, with other... Um, other views on the sign gifts and and whether or not there's still gifts of prophecy and things like that. Uh, but overall, if if you tend to be a cessationist, um, then the Holy Spirit indwells us and speaks to us, but he only speaks to us through the word. And it's not some kind of the flip side of it, too, is it's not some kind of um, Bardian understanding of it either, where you have this crisis encounter with Jesus Christ um, by reading the word, and only in that moment is the word actually the inspired word, and as soon as it becomes history, it's no longer um, inspired scripture, it's only history now, and it's a story that you can tell, a testimony that you can share, but it has no authority. Uh, it's not that either, all right? The word of God is always inspired, it is always quick, it's always alive, it's always powerful, and that's because the Holy Spirit is always accompanying it. So, so can I ask a question then about the link between Christ as the um say the the human okay one that was the second point right and yes, incarnate. the word because mm -hmm. i was just looking through this past week um like of all the places where the same description is given of both christ and the word and so i was try and understand again the inextricable link there too just in the dimension of when we try to talk about say the critical text we're giving it all sorts of characteristics that are nothing like either the spirit or the second person the trinity and we're trying to like pull it out and away from that inextricable link when you i mean the critical text is you know imperfect and you know the godhead is perfect and um you know it's fallen away the critical text has fallen away and so we're saying then that i mean they would be saying the scripture is that's a characteristic that's not true of christ or the spirit and those are both so i was just trying to think about it in terms of that inextricable link that's really important the inextricable mm -hmm. that reason because otherwise you're giving the bible characteristics that don't match with what they're inextricably linked with yeah i think that that is there's a splendid observation and let me just add to it because we don't want to it's not just the son and the spirit right um because the son is the apostle of god the sent one of the father he was sent to do the father's will then he is there to bear the father's message so we have the sender the father we have christ being the first apostle being sent by the father and then theologically you understand that the spirit is proceeds from the father and from the son so as soon as you say and, and just to help people you know kind of what becky's talking about here um it's difficult if you hold to this inextricable link between the incarnate word 
and the inspired word and the internal word, right? And they're all bound together, right? They all are kind of, um, they get their identity, specifically the internal word um, speaks to us through the inspired word and the inspired word comes to us by the incarnate word, who is the word, the archetypical word. As soon as we begin to speak in those terms, we I think it's fair to ask questions like, uh, is it then appropriate to say, we probably have most of the Bible, or 99% of the Bible, of your Bible, is the actual inspired word of God, or is the instrument of the internal word of God, 99% or 98, somewhere in that range, or to say, um, you know, the long ending in Mark, it doesn't really matter. Like if it's if it's in there, then good. If it's not in there, then it's also not that bad because in the end, no major doctrine hangs on the long ending of Mark. We can find resurrection accounts in other places in Scripture. Okay, again, that both the statement and the sentiment seem to be quite foreign, but, and and I think it is it is upon our interlocutors. It is their responsibility to be able to show us how that kind of language, those examples I just gave, um, dovetail so neatly, knit themselves so closely to language like the inextricable link between word and spirit, between incarnate word and inspired word, between the archetypical word, the incarnate word, the inspired word, and the internal word. This would be historically the relationship that would exist among these three uses of the word of God. Uh, so how is it historically, and now we would say in the present, do we speak of things like probability and it doesn't really affect doctrine and we have most of it? How does that language, theological language, uh, fit so well with Christ, the Spirit, the Father, and the written word? Right? It, it doesn't what's, seem like it would. What's the best place in the scripture then to address like someone whose concept that the archetypical word is not connected to the written word? Yeah. So again, as soon as we're beginning to speak in these kinds of terms, we're we're speaking on a theological level, right? So to to be able to just point to a, a one verse and square that away, it's more like taking uh, large portions of what the Bible teaches and systematizing them, asking, okay, if we believe this, if we believe, it would be right? So if we believe that the Father exists, and that the Father sent the Son, and that the Son is the apostle of the Father, and that the, the, the first apostle, Jesus, the sent one of the Father, called apostles, and that he declared, Jesus declared, that the church is going to be built on the foundation, not of these men, not like their bones are in the bottom of the church, but that their message, the apostolic message, is the ground, the foundation upon which the church will be built. So now we have, but then he says, but you won't be left alone. I am going to send the comforter, who we recognize as God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit. And then we're told that he prays for us, that he, that he groans for us, that he uh, speaks to us and bears witness with our spirit. And he is, he's vexed or when we sin. Um, this person is going to indwell us. And indwelling us, he, in, in the first century, gave us words. And then he bears witness with our spirit, either as either of us as a savior of life unto life or of death unto death, that those words are sealed upon our hearts. Those words are made effectual in our lives that he sanctifies us in a way that we're able to accept the teaching of the word, the reading of the word to change us. If you adopt all of that theology, which I think is just sound orthodox theology, then we're right back at the question, which is how can you speak of that um, process, that uh, history or systematic theology, and say, well, yeah, something like probability does just fit in there quite well, actually. It, it, it's just, it's like Cinderella's foot right into the, the glass slipper, right? It's not trying to force it in or shoehorn in probability or 99%. It, it's a great fit. Um, I've, I've honestly never seen the argument. 
the argument is something more like, well, God wanted us to have a corrupt Bible. I mean, it's only 90, it's 99% there. So it's only 1% that we're missing. And so that God thinks it's good enough for us, which of course is again, not substantiated in scripture. So uh, it's, it's, it's just, it seems like a theological assumption in an attempt to support a, um, what I would say is a merely evidential belief in probability. So anyway, those are great questions. Those are great questions. And they are, they are challenging. They are challenging at times, especially when there are so many. I think, I think that that is such a, like, I think if the, if, if things were flipped, right, if most of the church believed that the Bible they held in their hand was indeed the very word of God given to them, uh, and there were a handful of people on the outside that were trying to tell us, no, 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 like there is some of it that's not actually the word of God, and there's some of it you should doubt. And like you think it would be, it would just be a different climate altogether. So um, let's see. All right, we've got about nine or so minutes. So let's talk about our incarnational theology here, and then we'll read the note. This lecture lectures focuses on three in the list: the inspired word of Holy Scripture. Uh on number three, being grounded in the eternal word, the Son of God, inspiration gives insight into the final and fullest revelation of the Father in the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man. The heavenly written word, forever settled in heaven, was given by inspiration as the grammatical historical revelation of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, is God manifest in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, becoming a man, revealing the Father to us. The revelatory relationship between the written word and Jesus Christ, the word, is such that to change one is to change the other. A divine written word tells us of Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God. A mundane, radically historic written word tells the of the historic man, Jesus. Um, of course, this is, um, if you know anything about the search for the historical Jesus, right? Take the New Testament, basically get rid of all of the miracles, and then we're able to kind of whittle away the mythologizing, right? We demythologize Jesus, and we try to get to the, the real historical Jesus. But of course, to do that, there's so much of the Bible that needs to be rejected, because a supernatural Jesus, a, a God who is the Word, who revealed God to us, and is God himself, if he gives us a revelation, it's going to be in the same way. And if we get a revelation, and that revelation is going to reflect him, right? It's going to go both ways. The philosophical transition from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to the historical Jesus is seen in the new hermeneutic and the rejection of the orthodox doctrine of inspiration. So, um, about eight minutes left. I know we started late. Um, all right, I think we can squeeze this in. This is William Whitaker. Again, I showed you that big green book, right? Um, it's a beast to read, but it's so good. Good. Yeah. For authentic scripture must proceed immediately from the Holy Ghost himself. And therefore, Paul says that all scripture is divinely inspired. We confess that God hath not spoken by himself, but by others. For God inspired the prophets with what they said and made use of their mouths, tongues, and hands. The scripture, therefore, is even immediately the voice of God. Uh, there's so much that I want to say here. Maybe I shouldn't have read it. Um, let's talk really quick about dictation. We're going to talk about it more, Lord willing, next week. Um, but there's this idea uh, that dictation is bad, right? So you just have the, the, you have the Apostle John. He's sitting there at his desk. And the Lord is saying, write these words. In the beginning, God created, right? And he is just, he's not, he's not picking the words. He's not, this is not an issue of his will. He's just taking the word and he's writing it down. And most people do not like that, especially this day, uh, these, these days. They, they say that this is some kind of usurpation of John's will or something like that. So we'll just put that on pause for a second and say, okay, fine. Uh, I, I don't think I want to give it up because... Uh, well, we'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, the second way, though, or the way that, that I would like to, to uh, share this is God inspires John, not usurping his will, not going past his human experience, 
But John has a certain set of words. He has a certain vocabulary. He has a certain set of experiences and abilities. He has a certain capacity to write. Uh, all of these things God in his providential care has provided for John. All right? I give that to you. But beyond that, John is not in some way just kind of like uh, being surrounded by some kind of glow or effulgence or something. And then he's just of himself writing. No, for these words to be God's words, God is using the words that John has available to him and is informing John which words to write. And then you're going to say, well, where in the Bible does it say that's the theory of inspiration? And so I just, I just consider this. Jesus, well, God says himself, he, he, he says in the book of Proverbs by inspiration, he says, that a fitly spoken word is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And so we want to ask ourselves, who is finding the fittest word? Right? Who determines which word is the fittest, the most fitting, the most apt, the most, the, the perfect word to fit that context in the telling of that story or in the teaching of that lesson? Who is the one in the act of inspiration choosing the fittest, the most fit word? Is it John or is it the Holy Spirit? Right? Um, and maybe someone will say, well, John is. John is capable in his humanity and in his sin in some way by inspiration, which all of a sudden becomes really foggy. Like, okay, so what is it that inspiration enables? How is it that it enables John to choose the fittest word? Um, because God is not going to choose an unfit word. God wouldn't. John could. But God would never choose an unfit word. Every word that he chose is a perfectly fit word for the context, for the story, for the lesson. And so uh, I think it 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 strains reason less to say God is choosing these particular words. First, he's choosing the instrument. He's choosing John. And then in, because he, he could have had other people write the, any of the Gospels, but he chose four guys. One of them is John. And in choosing John, he is choosing the perfect word because John had all the necessary words available to him. And God, of all the words that John could have written, chooses the fittest, the fitly spoken word, the perfect word for that situation, which is yet another reason why we don't, from our side, we don't let any word go. Because our argument would be God has chosen the fittest word in every context, word upon word, line upon line. Not a single one of those words is less fit than the one before or after. So when we do get into it, we change just a few words here, maybe the ending of the Lord's Prayer, and we begin to make cases like it doesn't affect doctrine. It does affect doctrine because now we're beginning to say that those words given by God are not that big of a deal when God himself is saying, no, I have chosen the fittest words in the act of immediate inspiration, and those are the words I have preserved for you. Uh, and to say that it's otherwise is to say in some way that God's best choice of each word is not a sufficient choice or is not a worthy choice or is not an important choice because in our estimation, it currently does not affect any major doctrine. Um, and so there's a lot more at stake here than that when you start messing with just even a handful of words or words that you think are benign or or that are not um, valuable to any major doctrine. So um, anyway... When he says it's the immediate voice of God, though, that's the other thing, too. Notice notice the tense of the verb. He's not saying it was or that the first century church had it. The scripture is. The scripture is even immediately the voice of God. I want to say the same thing. But if you believe that your Bible is only 99% the voice of God, then you have to reconcile that with your God. Is he a 99% God? No, then how can his voice be only 99% his voice? So anyway, there's a lot there. Lord willing, we'll pick up more next week.
I do apologize for the late start tonight, but um, we got something in. Thank you for those who showed up and are faithful to to class. Um, nine lectures Thank you for your time. Oh man, absolutely, absolutely. I love this stuff. I tell you, you know, if you didn't have to work a job, you know, <laughs> you didn't have to work a job. But anyway, all right. Well, it's good to see everybody. If if you don't have any questions. We can hang it up for night. If you do have questions, I would love to answer them. So I toss it over to you guys. Anything? Nothing for me. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank, um, you. thank you for your questions. And uh, Lord willing, we will have everything firing on all cylinders next Tuesday. <laughs> so, thank you. You're welcome. We'll talk to you all later. See ya.